I said, I know the melody. <laughs> And take that out. <laughs> and did he? Yes. Good. That's you know that that's a wasted line that you could use in some nice counter melodies or something. You know. Do you mind speaking about the Pied Pipers? Oh, I love it. The reason I say it that way is because I think that you probably have been interviewed to death about the Pied Pipers. But oh, that's all right. Listen, that's that's my first love group singing. No, I loved the Pipers. Loved singing with them and hated leaving them. I don't know. There's something very satisfying about singing lead and group singing. Did you create the group? Uh, no. We met, as a matter of fact, on that great musical Alexander's Ragtime Band. The, oh. the, uh, there was a group called the Four Esquires and a group called the Three Rhythm Kings. And the Four Esquires and the Three Rhythm Kings and Joe Stafford used to pass their time singing together between takes. That was the beginning of the Pied Pipers. There were eight of us in the beginning, yeah. Lack of work finally pared us down to a quartet. <laughs> How long after you had formed did you come to Dorsey? Let's see. I guess we starved to death for about a year. And then one of the King sisters said that, you know, we're, having, we're going to a big singer's jam session on Sunday. You guys are invited. And the jam session turned out to be at the house that Paul Weston and Axel Stordahl had rented for the summer while the band was playing the old Palomar Ballroom. And so we went to their little rented house. I think every singer in town was there. It was a real singer's jam session. So we sang, and that's the first that Paul and Axel had heard us. And eventually they recommended us to Tommy, and Tommy had us on as guest stars just without ever having heard us. And we drove to New York uh, to do one guest shot. Can you imagine eight silly people driving to 3,000 miles? Oh, the promise of one guest shot? I guess it takes youth, but that's what we did, and that was our first acquaintance with Tom. And uh, we did about, I guess, nine or ten shows, his radio show. But anyway, we did guest shots. I think, well, I guess, the tenth guest shot was the first time the sponsor had ever been in this country. The sponsor was in London, and the song that the Pipers were doing that day was Hold Tight, which got us fired. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, I <laughs> the expect sponsor that. said, get those people <gasps> off my show. So, <laughs> so we got fired and walked the streets of New York for about six months until we ran out of money. All well, Everybody came home, and four of the guys quit. They had to leave. They had families to support. We hadn't worked in months. I had gone down to get my last unemployment check looking starvation in the face, and I got home, and there was a message to call operator something in Chicago. I was very puzzled, knowing no one in Chicago, but it was free, so why not? So I returned the call, and it was Tom, and he said, I won't take eight of you, but I'd li I want a quartet with you singing lead, and I said, well, as a matter of fact, that's what we are at this point. So in 1939, we joined the Dorsey Band, and we were with him for three years. And what great songs. Yeah. Was Matt Dennis working with Dorsey specifically? I introduced Matt to Tommy. Oh. At that time, he had this music publishing firm, and we were coming for one of our first trips out to California since we joined the band. And I told Tom, I said, I know a couple of guys that write tremendous songs, and I wish you'd listen to them. And he said, okay. So we had a record date, and I called Matt and Tom Adair and said, sing some of your stuff for Tommy Dorsey. Tom hired him right away, I think after about one song. He hired him, and they were part of his organization for several years, because I was a big fan of Matt's even before I was with Dorsey. What a tremendous talent he was. Great, just great. I don't know if he ever knew how good he was. When you talk about harmonies, Harry Warren used to call them shoulder chords, because <laughs> yeah, just you shoulder. just go, oh, you can't help yeah. moving that way. <laughs> Boy, he had lots of shoulder chords in his songs. Oh, yeah, Paul <laughs> laughed at that. Paul loved the shoulder chord story. Because <laughs> my first first solo record I ever made was a Matt Dennis song, a Little Man with a Candy Cigar. Yes. Yeah. It's the only time I went to Tommy and I said, Tom, I've never done this before in my life, and I'll probably never do it again. But if you record that song, could I please do it? Because <laughs> I wasn't the solo singer in the band at that time. And he said, sure, and he let me have it. Was he a nice man to work with? I, Tom has a, a reputation that I never saw. He was real easy. I never had one 
not one word. Because hmm. uh, I always found if you did your job, you'd had no trouble with Tom. He ignored honest mistakes. The one thing he wouldn't ignore was uh, laxness and not mm-hmm. that he wouldn't tolerate. And I don't blame him. No, I enjoyed where I never had any problem hmm. whatsoever. When did you start singing solo? Solo? Well, when we came back uh, after we left Tom, that's when we started working with Mercer. Because Mercer had been a fan of the band and had told us, if you ever leave Tommy, or be, you know, please get in touch with me because I'm starting a record company. So we did, and he did sign us to Capitol. The quartet and me, or is it I? <laughs> when we first went with Capitol, it was basically the pip- Pipers. But John Mercer was a, well, he was a good fan of mine. So he signed me at Capitol. He recorded me solo for the first time. And I stayed with the Pipers until we finally were doing a radio show five nights a week. I couldn't do both, you know, singing the lead with the Pipers and doing the solo work, too. It was too much. And was that show broadcast, was it done twice for the East and the West Coast? Did you have to do two? Yeah. Uh, so people don't realize that when you did a nightly show, you were doing two nightly shows. Yeah. So that's when I split from the guys, and Junie Hutton came in, bless her heart, Hmm. one of the great lead singers of all time, and she came in and took my place. That's when I went solo, I guess it was 1944. Right smack in the middle of the war. Yeah. What an extraordinary time. That was. I've often thought it was funny how you can, um, you wouldn't remember it like I can, but how the country could be in the most horrible, biggest war of all time, and feel good about that time. Maybe it's because we were so united and everybody was looking in the same direction. It's a feeling that comes through in the music. Well, and the the, the thing is, too, it's a time that music gets good. I don't know if it's because war allows men to be sentimental. I mean, there's a lot of very tender love songs written during war times, and men aren't very big on tenderness as a rule. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But somehow war allows them to do that. It's interesting to me that most of the hit songs during wartime are the sentimental songs. Sentimental. They're not the flag-waving patriotic songs. No, uh -uh. they're about love and about home and girls and boys and all that stuff. When did you fall in love with Paul Weston? We knew each other since the year one. And uh, 20 years later, it's like, hey, I think <laughs> I think there's a boy there. <laughs> <laughs> and no, we really, we'd known each other for ages, since 1938, when we first met. Going back to that afternoon at Paul and Axe's house, I went to New York in 44 to do my first nightclub, which was the Martinique. And Paul came back for that. And he came to the nightclub, the opening night, and my sisters were there. And after the show was over, we all went back to our hotel to just relax and have some coffee. And my sisters were over in one corner talking away, and Paul and I suddenly found each other kissing like mad on the other side of the room. And that was the beginning. It was like out of the blue. Well, you know, it was like, wow. <laughs> and that's after you'd been making music together for Yeah, for, for ages. Long time. Yeah, ages. <laughs> it was great. Very romantic. Mm. Some of the songs you recorded that became hits were not necessarily uh, the most classic material. Well, let's put it in two words, Mitch Miller. (laughs) Okay. Mitch had a lot of talent about him. I mean, the only thing he didn't have was the ability to fit the song to the person. I just don't think you give Joe Stafford's voice Chow Willie to sing. Mm -hmm. It, It doesn't fit. I'm not at all against a, quote, novelty, unquote, song. I've done those, and successfully. Temptation. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, indeed. I don't mind that at all. But some of the material that Mitch handed out was was pretty rotten. Did you uh, have to record what they gave you? No, I didn't have to, except I was in a kind of a corner because... Most record artists, I gather, actually pay for their own dates, and then when the record sells enough, then they start getting royalties. Mm. But initially, they pay for the orchestra. and this. Well, I never did. My contract was very different. I didn't pay for anything. This was you yeah. left Capitol and went to? Well, I had the same contract at Capitol. Mm-hmm. I never paid for studio or orchestra. That very fact put me to at least cooperate 
talk somewhat with the people I was working with. And Mitch and I just didn't see eye to eye on music at all. But I never recorded anything that I thought was really terrible. The American popular song was truly one of America's greatest contributions. No question. No other country, for reasons that I don't quite understand, was able to ever match the output of the pop music America put out. And I guess most of the people that wrote it were Europeans. Of European descent, yeah, yes. Yeah, uh-huh. Maybe possibly England put out, you know, a few, but nothing to compare with, if you want to call it, Ten Pan Alley. And I think that uh, came to a halt. I mean, are there any standards in the making? There are very few, certainly. Yeah. I think there are talented writers. Oh. But, but they don't have opportunities to be no. heard. Oh, no, that's, see, that's the point. I mean, I'm sure the talent is still there. Yes. You see, the thing is, in the heyday of the really good popular song, you had some pretty heavy teachers teaching you. Hmm. You had Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey and Benny Goodman and uh, Woody Herman. You had a whole bunch of people playing what was good. And after that passed, you had DJs that were very nice men, but not necessarily musically uh, smart and so they started playing what they knew and you know just uh, the whole thing went went down in quality i think and also i think maybe economics had something to do with it because suddenly kids of 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 had enough money to influence a market so your quality that's not going to uphold all the things you are you know that's pretty hard for a 13 year old to understand Whereas Heartbreak Hotel is not, not hard at 